Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India And welcome to lecture 12 of Gender and Society. This lecture is um, going to be on technology and healthcare. So, in the past uh, lecture, you have seen that um, what are the various ramifications, what are the various processes that are at play uh, between gender and health. Uh, health. So, um, we have in the past uh, lecture explored the um, various understandings of health, um, you know, from the classic biomedical model to understanding um, of health using the holistic uh, model. And then we have looked at how the um, World Health Organization actually defines health as. Um, so, um, and we have seen that how our biological understanding, how our socio-cultural understanding, all of that actually, um, you know, combined together to inform what we understand um, as health of a person or health of a uh, society. So, in this lecture, what I am going to do is walk you through um, some of the basic understandings of um, how technology actually combines with the idea of health and um, you know um, some of the very important emerging um, fields of study, some of the very important emerging questions um, that are um, you know interrogated in this regard. So, before I start, um, I want to uh, let you know that just like you know gender and society is a you know heavily interdisciplinary uh, field um, topics such as you know te technology's role on healthcare or how healthcare and technology inform each other um, you know is sitting at the intersection of uh, multiple disciplines. So, we will see um, you know um, how you know these intersections actually work out. Um, but just to start uh, with a couple of key questions here that how can our understandings of gender be informed by exploring the socio-technical relations of information and communication technologies or ICTs um, in healthcare. So, um, you know how does gender actually inform the idea um, you know of ICT and uh, you know in, in, in vice versa how does ICT actually um, you know um, give us understanding newer understanding of how gender is negotiated as a process. And the second question that um, we will be looking at is how far can an appreciation of the ways in which gender works inform and improve our understanding of how ICTs are being developed implemented and used in healthcare contexts. So, um, as you can imagine and as you already may have identified that one of the intersections of um, you know talking about technology and healthcare which is a huge huge you know field um, and it is practically impossible to talk about all the technological advances in um, just one lecture. Um, but as you can imagine that um, the role of information technology, the role of information and communication technology is at the very heart of the matter, is sitting at the very uh, core of the matter. Also sitting at the very core of the matter is a sociological understanding of how technology and healthcare, um, you know, uh, inform each other. So, we have uh, you know an emerging idea of self care which is highly culturally driven and um, you know it is promoted uh, through cultural practices and social practices and government policies. Um, so, we see this idea of um, a transition from uh, you know um, curing um, a disease as 
um, you have seen in the last lecture that um, of the several transitions that we have uh, made in this respect, this is one such that we have transitioned from the idea of curing to the idea of um, you know preventive um, you know ways and to the idea of self care to the to the idea that you know uh, you know what can you do to um, take care of yourself what can you do to prevent falling sick and the very technologies that redefine health are also the means through which this individualization can occur through um, e-health diagnostic tests and the commodification of restorative tissue such as stem cells and clone embryos. So, you see that the, uh, the premise, you know, the boundary of this field of technology um, and healthcare is huge. So, we are talking on the one hand about self-care, you know, everyday living, day-to-day -day life, um, to, you know, we are talking about, um, you know, restorative uh, tissues, um, we are talking about examples of stem cells, clone embryos. So, you can imagine the breadth of the, um, you know, the, um, the field of technology in um, use of technology in healthcare uh, services. So, from a sociological perspective, um, when we talk of digital health, we come across, um, you know, four broad areas uh, that, you know, uh, inform each other and they inform um, and they make possible the growth of um, digital health. So, as you can see, digital health is sitting at the center of um, these broad, you know, disciplines of you know, sociology of health, sociology of algorithms, computational social science, critical digital sociology. So, all of these actually merge at a point um, to give us an understanding of digital health or digital healthcare. So, when you have to understand uh, how digital health works, um, it will be important for you to bring in. Um, you know, some of the understanding from uh, each of these uh, fields of inquiry. So, what we have seen that over time, um, you know, the idea of digital healthcare has um, progressed through several stages. So, um, starting, you know, as early as 2003, you, as you can see, where, um, uh, you know, it was imagined to be an age of learning in terms of digital healthcare, um, and you know uh, scholars were asking you know sort of questions that what is it and why should we care about digital healthcare? So that was you know um, that was the one of the um, introductory phases, one of the first phases when um, the idea of digital healthcare was actually introduced in um, in, in society that. Um, you know, uh, scholars and practitioners and researchers, they were trying to understand that what is digital healthcare and why should we care about digital healthcare? What is it that it is giving us, you know, um, an added advantage? So, um, it started from there and then we go uh, to the age of interest. Um, the second stage is the age of interest that how can we seed innovation? So, now we have accepted that, you know, we understand or we kind of understand what digital healthcare is and so how can we, you know, make it uh, more innovative? So, how can we more start, you know, discovering newer avenues, um, you know, understanding newer concepts with regard to digital healthcare? The third stage um, that, you know, the age of implementation is asking how can we do digital health well. So, the first two uh, phases were actually invested in understanding, um, you know, what is it and then um, the from the third phase onwards, which is, you know, um, the current phase um, that we are in is questioning that how can we do digital health well? What is it that we need to do to, um, you know, progress? Uh, make progress um, with this um, idea. And the next, um, you know, phase that is um, projected to be the age of scale. That is how can we maximize our impact. So, we have gone through, you know, asking what is it, how is it 
And then um, you know, we are asking how can we maximize the impact of digital um, you know, healthcare. So as you can see that we are um, currently um, in the third stage going on to the fourth stage um, soon that um, we are now uh, engaged more with the question of um, how can we do digital health um, better and then what are the um, you know uh, benefits that we are gaining and how can we maximize the impact of uh, digital healthcare in society. So we have seen just to give you uh, some idea of how health information systems work, um, we have seen that um, there has been um, you know changing boundaries. Um, and relationships between traditional producers and users of health information. So the relationship between producers and users have undergone a change and um, this uh, you know has been manifested or facilitated um, by the collection of health information. So how information about health is collected, the distribution of health information to citizens. So you know how you know or how well um, accessible are these information to the um, people in the society and the growth of new imaging technologies. So um, you know what are the newer ways of um, you know applying technology to image processing um, with regard to healthcare and here you can see um, this is actually um, a research work that was done by a set of scholars. So you can follow this uh, link if you want to read up uh, about this paper. Um, this is just showing an application of medical imaging technologies and um, you know how can we take it um, a step further. So we have also seen that um, the government of India has invested um, a lot in understanding uh, you know digital health and to the extent that um, we have uh, the national health portal um, by the government of India and you see some um, snapshots from the website that it has become you know a serious um, national policy and uh, you know if you go to this website it, um, it is very informative um, in the sense that it will give you um, you know informa information at the click of a button um, about hospitals, about doctors, about you know um, self care. So um, you know we have seen that at the national level we um, do have a very serious um, effort going on um, you know uh, with regard to digital health. And in the national health policy of 2017 um, uh, we see that these targets these goals are actually quite spelt out. For example, uh, you know the I'm, I'm quoting from the policy that leveraging the potential of digital health for systematic linkages between the various levels of care that is primary, secondary and tertiary would ensure continuity of care. So um, they're pointing out that this you know the level of health care should um, you know um, include all of these levels of primary, secondary, tertiary and um, that is what is going to ensure the continuity of care of the society. Then they also talk about the um, you know digital health technology ecosystem which is uh, the National Digital Health Authority or the NDHA will be set up to regulate, develop and deploy digital health across the continuum of care. So they are actually having a health authority to um, you know look more deeper into um, the, um, uh, the ideas of digital health. And the you know the road ahead from here is to understand then what are the various applications of digital health in society. So from a sociological um, perspective. Uh, when we try to talk about digital healthcare and gender, uh, digital reproductive healthcare is one of the um, emerging and very significant areas of inquiry um, in this respect. So let me just um, also remind you that when we are talking about digital healthcare, we are also talking about um, you know some factors such as um, understanding of a traditional healthcare. So what it means, um, you know say if we take the example of reproductive health care, so what it would mean traditionally um, um, with regard to reproductive health care. Um, 
computer literacy. So, how well can a person, um, you know, use um, computers, or, or rather, uh, you know, does a person have access to, um, you know, computers or not? Um, media access and usage so again the question of resource access and the um, question of you know how well um, can you use um, some of these data that is available and um, the idea of health awareness the idea of health concern um, you know um, how much does it affect you how much do you you know um, uh, value it uh, actually go a long way to inform our understanding of digital healthcare so where we see this, uh, you know, the idea of digital reproductive healthcare, um, we can talk about it um, in three possible ways. So the first um, way that we can talk about it uh, is talking about discourse and practice. So uh, if you look at you know how discourse and praxis um, operate so these are you know classic um, ways of understanding that what people um, you know say and what people do in society so the relationships between discourse structure um, and action uh, in this case are you know analyzed and um, with regard to you know praxis um, the questions um, you know concerned around um, what are the various values, what are the various norms, what are the various um, expectations that are implicated um, in such technological um, applications. So uh, that is one way and there is another um, way of uh, you know um, understanding. So what are the expectations of these applications on healthcare and uh, you know how is the understanding of um, the human body actually changing with the uh, you know application of um, digital practices so the idea of digital embodiment so how is you know um, understandings of um, motherhood of fatherhood of of self care of um, you know, um, monitoring the body. So, you know, how are, you know, these ideas changing um, over time with the um, use of digital healthcare and the idea of um, intersectionality being scaled. So, um, you know, this is also um, emerging field of inquiry um, in, um, in um, sociological study that um, we talked about the idea of intersectionality where um, you know uh, we look at a person's social location based on the various um, axes of differences such as gender, such as age, such as religion, um, nationality, ethnicity and here um, you can see you know um, it is sketched out that way. So, um, the, the intersectionality that is also scaled which means that um, this intersectionality is um, you know negotiated at various geographic scales from the um, starting from the body, starting um, you know uh, from the family to the region to the group to the um, national to the international. So you know all of these geographic scales at which um, you know it is negotiated. So uh, this is you know um, some of the significant ways you can actually um, understand um, the idea of digital reproductive healthcare so through discourse and praxis, through digital embodiments and um, by understanding how intersectionality is scaled. So as I said that um, the idea of um, technology and healthcare um, and gender is actually um, you know very overlapping and it shares um, you know a lot of um, understanding with um, each other and with you know other fields. So if we look at gender and technology we see that this um, you know relationship between gender and technology um, looks at the social shaping approach um, which is hierarchical inflected by social class and gender. So um, the relationship between gender and technology is um, you know socially uh, you know shaped and socially um, constructed to a large extent. The relationship between technology and, gen and, and health um, you know brings with it the understandings of the sociology of science and technology studies or STS um, 
as it is popularly known the socio-technical perspectives on health informatics. So, um, health informatics uh, or social informatics is a field um, that uh, you know has emerged for quite a few years now. Although um, you know uh, work is going on in this regard, quite significant works are going on in this regard. Um, but then this um, you know field, technology and health, um, actually again looks at this socio-technical perspective that um, it is a product of the social and in society. And the third um, key area of inquiry in this respect um, is gender and health, something that um, we have looked at um, in the last lecture that what can be the gendered health consequences, um, specific health risks um, women and men face in society. So, this is a relationship that we have explored in the last lecture and it forms the third um, key area of inquiry in this respect. So, in this respect, we also have to um, understand another theoretical um, framework that we may find helpful to understand how, um, you know, um, technology works with, um, you know, um, human aspects of healthcare. So, this is called the actor network theory and um, the human um, and the non-human as the theory states should be integrated into the same conceptual framework and assigned equal amounts of agency. So, this is a theory that comes from, um, you know, a sociological uh, background where it is uh, proposed that there is a relationship between human and non-human artifacts, um, you know, or structures and they can be studied as part of the um, conceptual framework. And uh, when we talk of agency and when we talk of discourse, um, so we in this in this actor network theory, we see that, you know, equal amounts of agency are actually um, put in the human and non-human um, comp components and, uh, you know, as is prevalent in the um, discourse. So, this uh, theory, this actor network relationship actually explores how relationships between people, objects and concepts are formed and why. So, you know, as um, you know, as human beings, um, we deal with a lot of non-human, um, you know, things. And um, so, there, there exists a relationship between, you know, that human and non-human. And, you know, this, this theory actually helps us to understand how all of those um, relations are built and then, uh, you know, how can we um, you know, make meaning of why such relations are formed between the human and the non-human. So, here um, in this graph, as you can see, um, you know, um, this is uh, used as an example here um, that this shows a relationship between users, um, you know, graphical user interface designer, applications, um, you know, customers. Um, so, all sorts of things that can be human or non-human and, you know, they are put in a network to understand how one relates to another. So, this is another um, example to show that, um, you know, borrowing from the actor network um, theory, we can think of developing mobile analytics and um, say, for example, you want to build an app. Um, that, uh, you know, measures or that, uh, you know, tells you something about, uh, you, you know, a health condition, maybe a reproductive health condition, maybe, uh, you know, um, a health condition such as diabetes. So, you want to develop that app and, um, you know, this is one way um, uh, of understanding that, you know, um, if you have the app, you know, if you want the app as an, you know, end product, then you have to first have an understanding of who that app is going to be used by. And if you do not have an understanding of the society or the type of people who will be using that app, then, um, you know, chances are that after you have built that app, um, you know, um, there may be, you know, people or society um, who are not willing to use that app. So, uh, to do a study before making an app um, will just help you, uh, you know, um, cater or deliver um, the society 
better. So, here you can see that uh, the development of uh, mobile analytics that it, it is kind of a you know again an actor network um, um, idea where you have the human and the non-human components here who are uh, not just you know in a network but also in kind of a flow um, with each other. So, you know this is the type of relationship that may be understood uh, you know using the act actor network um, idea. So, um, just to um, you know emphasize that how important is it for us to understand uh, that apps or, or, or applications are you know socio-cultural artifacts, they are you know as much socio-cultural products as they are technical products. Um, so, here is a very powerful quote um, by Lupton in 2014 that apps are new digital technology tools, but they are also socio-cultural products. They are active participants that shape human bodies and selves as part of heterogeneous networks creating new practices and knowledge. They are therefore generative, a productive form of power. So, you see that um, from this quote, it is not just evident that apps are socio-cultural products, but they are also um, you know um, a source of power relationship. They are also informing a sort of power dynamics in society. So, apps have a potential to shape the ways in which the human body is understood, visualized and treated by healthcare workers and non-professional people alike. So, uh, you know, so, you know, every time you would use an app, you will see that, you know, how much of a socio-cultural understanding has gone behind crafting or behind building that app as much as um, it would need a technological idea, technological skill. But, um, you know, it is probably impossible to not think about apps, um, you know, um, without these um, social cultural components. So, they are as much social cultural products as they are um, technological products. So, you know, this is one uh, point where we need to assert that um, the relationship between um, technology and healthcare, um, you know, in terms of you know when it's talking about the, um, the embodiment or discourse or practice praxis, um, you know it's one of socio-technical ensembles. So it's one of uh, you know um, it's it's bringing together all of these socio-cultural factors um, to um, inform um, a product of technology. So we have also uh, seen that social media plays a huge role um, in healthcare. Um, uh, services and this is uh, one way that um, social media allows more people to take part in the discussion and share knowledge. So, you know, um, for example, take um, Facebook, take um, Twitter, uh, you know, how much of interaction, how much of discussion um, and knowledge sharing actually um, go on is unimaginable. So, uh, you know, over time social media has become um, one of the most important platforms um, for um, knowledge sharing, knowledge production and discussion. Social media also creates cognitive and real surpluses that can free up our resources to deal with essential needs. So, um, you know, you this is a cognitive journey that you make with social um, media that, uh, you know, um, is factored into um, everyday living. And it democratizes the decision making process so that needs find solutions rather than other way around. So, um, you know, um, it just gives us um, as society um, a, a platform for making decisions um, and then finding, um, you know, solutions. So, you know, the idea of social media has factored into people's life uh, now in such um, you know, intricate ways that it is difficult not to pay, um, you know, attention, um, you know, to, to uh, pra uh, practices regarding that. 
So, the fact that digital media culturally matters is undeniable, but showing how, where and why it matters is necessary to push against peculiarly narrow presumptions about the universality of digital experience. And this was proposed by Coleman in 2010, where, um, you know, the scholar is saying that, you know, we know for sure that, you know, there is a very important cultural implication of our digital media, but what is not clear yet, and probably this will be a work in progress for the next, um, you know, decade or so, um, that how, where and why it matters, um, you know, um, will give us, you know, much better idea uh, to break free of narrow presumptions um, that the digital experience is universal for um, everyone. It is not and um, therefore we need to know, we need to understand that how, where and why do these, um, you know, experiences differ and, um, you know, what are the emerging patterns out of um, such differences. So, having um, accepted the fact that there is a huge cultural implication on the use of, uh, you know, uh, the digital healthcare systems. Um, Let us now look at one of the um, areas in which, uh, or, you know, in terms of reproductive healthcare, um, where technology has played a huge role and continues to do so um, in understanding um, various sociological ramifications in society. And um, uh, this is the case of the assisted reproductive technologies. So, over time, um, we have seen that there are um, you know, these efforts, um, whether it is, um, you know, uh, traditional healthcare or, or digital healthcare or, you know, however you want to put it, that societies have tried to um, address issues of globalization, issues of inequalities um, through various, um, you know, um, technological ventures. And one of the inequalities um, that, you know, can be talked about in this respect is the idea of infertility. And infertility affects more than 15 percent of all reproductive aged couples worldwide at some point in their lives. So, it is a it is a very significant global problem that um, we see you know worldwide. Infertility affects around 80 million women and men worldwide a global reproductive health problem. So, it has been, um, you know, put forward as a global reproductive um, problem or a gro gro global reproductive health issue that affects, you know, this huge number of around 80 million women and men worldwide. Um, and so, um, it is not unique to any particular society, not unique to any particular country or group of people. Now, what has, um, you know, shifted over time, um, um, and space probably is the idea that infertility, if we have to term it as a problem, um, I, I like to call it as an issue, not a problem. Um, it, it, the, the focus has shifted from being a, you know, females problem to a couples problem. So, um, that is a major um, shift in focus that we see um, that, you know, infertility, the changing ideas around infertility is brought about in society is that now, um, you know, it is looked at as, um, you know, a, um, couples problem and therefore, um, you know, um, scholarly work actually addresses it as a reproductive aged couples problem. So, we see um, this is a quite significant, um, you know, couples problem across the world. And we see that, um, you know, the various um, technologically assisted reproduction um, is largely restricted to the global elites, whereas the infertile poor who are at the highest risk of infertility are devalued. So, there are some patterns, there are some trends that come out of how, um, you know, technology actually has influenced um, the um, uh, reproduction process. Um, so, what is seen that it is largely restricted to the global um, privileged class, the um, global elites, whereas um, the, the 
poor people who suffer from infertility and who are the highest risk of infertility are actually kind of um, left out of the process, left out of the um, you know technological um, assistance. And we see that as a result of that there is a pattern called stratified reproduction which are the ways in which political, economic and social forces um, structure the conditions that are which that are which women carry out physical and social reproductive labor. So we see that um, it gives rise to a stratification in society because of um, you know um, this class based um, access to resource. So um, you know this is one way of understanding how stratas are created in society, um, you know, how um, social forces structure conditions. Um, and so this is um, what the assisted ARTs, uh, as it um, popularly known as, um, have brought in society that um, they have also brought with it um, um, an understanding of stratified reproduction. So what has been seen over time in terms of embodiment and subjectivities, um, if we have to talk about the, um, the role of digital embodiment here, that um, ARTs are gendered technologies with highly specific and differentiated applications on men's and women's bodies. So we see that um, the process in which um, you know ARTs are carried out, and there are you know multiple ways, there are multiple uh, stages um, that um, ARTs are carried out, but they, um, you know, if you look at uh, in scholarly research, um, you know, much of them have described um, ARTs as gender technologies um, with differentiated applications on um, male and female bodies. So. Um, more invasive on women's bodies. Um, so, you know, practices such as which include um, ARTs are, are seen to be more, um, you know, um, invasive on female bodies, um, such as, you know, practices such as um, super ovulation or injecting hormones, um, etc. And as an unintended consequence, the very existence of ARTs may serve to reinforce cultural motherhood mandates for women in many societies. And this is a point that um, you need to understand that why do we have ARTs, um, you know, to treat infertility or, or for other reproductive um, issues that, um, you know, often there is a cultural um, understanding in many um, societies um, around the world which is um, the understanding of the motherhood mandate that um, you know if a woman is um, diagnosed um, or if a couple is diagnosed to be infertile um, much of the time the blame actually falls on the women for not being able to um, reproduce and that brings with it the understanding of um, the motherhood mandate in that society and therefore much of these um, innovations of ARTs have been uh, reinforced by cultural ideas um, of um, you know um, mandating certain gender roles um, and, and ART is a classic example of that. Women's heightened embodiment of ART is also also in manifests um, in men being treated as the second sex in ART practices and discourses. So for once, um, you know, in this innovative practice that scholars have pointed out that, um, you know, traditionally what has happened is um, women have been labeled as the uh, second sex. And for once in ART, because the focus is on the female body, because the focus is on um, cultural mandates of um, women in society, um, um, the idea of, um, you know, male privilege is actually taking a back seat here. And, um, you know, men are being treated as the second sex, um, which is traditionally um, the reverse as is seen in scholarship. Um, and in most societies, male infertility remains deeply hidden because of its conflation with impotency and emasculation. So um, this is again a classic, classic example for you to see that, you know, there are these signifiers um, which are attached to the, um, you know, construction, the cultural construction of masculinity, the cultural construction of femininity. and. Oftentimes, what happens is um, if 
um, you know, an infertility uh, issue is diagnosed in a couple, and if it's the, um, you know, the um, issue is with the male in the couple, oftentimes that remains hidden. Oftentimes it is not um, exposed because, um, you know, exposing that will, um, you know, take away the signifying factors of masculinity um, or. Um, you know, um, the privileged position in society. So it is a very, very, um, you know, common phenomena that um, the if it is a problem, you know, the male infertility is a problem, it remains deeply hidden, it is not, um, you know, um, uh, spoken about, it's not discussed. So these are, you know, as you can see, um, some of the major ways in which we can understand the role of um, ARTs and by extension the role of digital um, healthcare practices um, as it would have a direct influence on um, you know um, a person or a group or a uh, society. So we um, have different ideas of embodiment, we have different ideas of um, subjectivities um, and um, and there are social repercussions. So um, society actually, um, you know, um, behaves differently. Society reacts, responds differently with regard to each of these um, embodiments and subjectivities. So we see that uh, the, with the application of uh, digital healthcare practices such as um, assisted reproductive technologies, um, our understanding of kinship and family has also changed over time. So if you recall some of the understanding from um, previous lecture on uh, family and gender and kinship, um, you will see that uh, you know if we now understand or try to understand those relationships um, with regard to um, practices such as surrogacy that you know it's um, you know um, the process by which a couple or a family would um, you know plan to have a child. So, you know, um, the, the process of surrogacy, um, the process of destabilizing biological understandings of the family. So, um, you know, uh, until, you know, we know that kinship um, primarily has been based on a biological understanding of family through kin or blood through marriage or adoption and we see that these newer um, ways of um, you know having a family um, actually destabilizes the biological understanding. It also unseats traditional notions of heterosexual parenthood. So societies um, as you um, know by now are uh, positioned on an understanding that parenthood must come comprise of a heterosexual couple, so between a, a man and a woman. And um, you know, with this new forms of technologies um, to have family, to have children, to have babies, um, it is also, um, you know, um, destabilizing or unseating these traditional notions that there are, you know, parents who are, you know, who can be either single parent or, um, you know, same sex parents um, who, who have um, now an option to have a child or have a baby and therefore it is um, challenging um, the um, you know the single understanding of um, family as um, you know or parenthood as heterosexual parenthood. And the introduction of ARTs particularly donor insemination for um, lesbian and gestational surrogacy for gay men has led to the queering of reproduction. So as you will see um, in the lecture on um, queer um, theory and queer relations that this in a way leads to a queering of understanding of how we understand um, reproduction and this goes hand in hand with the previous point that um, we now have newer understandings of, of, of how um, you know families can be formed in society and um, these are some of the ways that are playing very important roles to um, you know help us um, craft new definitions of family, new definitions of social relationships. With um, that also comes something that is known as embryo ethics and you know scholars have pointed out um, that there can be a lot of ethics that is involved with the ART process. So multiple sets of inequalities surface in the practice of assisted reproduction reflecting intersecting oppressions based on gender, race, class and nationality. So 
as you well know by now that um, you know each of these um, components um, gender, race, class, nationality each of them actually contribute um, to an understanding of creation of inequality in society and um, you know the the, pra the practice of assisted reproduction um, you know actually uh, makes it more uh, visible makes it more um, uh, tangible so um, we see that is um, you know one of the ethical considerations or one of the visible um, concerns um, the poor minority women in some countries are being recruited or you know as you know some scholars would say coerced as gestational surrogates so you see that um, you know the minority women particularly from rural poor um, parts of the society um, uh, including um, in india that are being recruited for um, this uh, this practice of uh, surrogacy um, practice of gestational surrogacy and um, I would encourage you to look up a few documentaries on surrogacy um, you know in India where um, the practice has gone through various um, legislations over time and um, I would like you to find out what are those um, you know stages that uh, you know India as a country has gone through and where do we currently stand in terms of um, surrogacy so that is something I want you to find out and we also see that religion um, may impact the practices of assisted reproduction more directly for example um, as scholars point out that across the sunni muslim world gamete donation and surrogacy have been religiously prohibited so um, as you can see that you know one axis of differentiation um, religion can have a direct implication on um, you know um, the idea of assisted reproductive technology and um, you know the idea of egg donation so um, one of the processes of you, you know the, the ARTs actually are carried out is um, when they identify um, you know um, the infertility issue what they do is um, they extract um, the eggs and they you know um, freeze it and then they would you know treat it and then in the meantime if the eggs are not required that is um, you know the woman conceives and has a child so these eggs are usually donated to another um, woman who would need them now this comes with a lot of you know ethical um, concerns a lot of ethical questions that you know um, one woman's egg is being donated to another and um, I would uh, in this regard I would um, you know encourage you to read up the ART bill of 2014 um, in India so um, as the ART bill says and it's it's a you know long document so please uh, read it up um, that ART today is a 30 billion industry in India with over 3000 clinics across the country. Infertility is the commonest medical problem in 30 to 40 years of age group of couples in India. And you know the ART bill actually points out some of these um, very important um, ways in which um, you know family, kinship, um, can be um, redefined and some of these um, you know ethical connotations around um, processes such as practices such as egg donation. So how do we then um, understand um, ARTs with intimate relations in family and marriage and um, you know we see that uh, it is um, global issue um, global infertility which has several of these social consequences and um, you know either um, you know it is treated or you know families drift apart or there are other consequences of um, infertility and we have seen that how um, you know practices of inclusion of technology um, you know in this process of treatment actually creates various forms of um, embodiments various forms of subjectivities um, you know um, for um, the um, for the couple involved and we have also seen that how new directions in kinship and family studies can you know um, come out of uh, this understanding of kinship um, of this understanding of uh, in, of uh, application of technology in um, reproductive healthcare and which leads also 
um, to the question of embryo ethics, um, as we just discussed that, um, you know, um, what are some of these ethical connotations um, that the ART Bill of 2014 um, spells out. Um, so, um, I again want to um, emphasize that please go and take a look at the ART Bill um, to find out more about um, what can be, you know, some of the social ramifications. So, what we have seen is um, over time, um, this has been, you know, strung into the popular understanding so much that we see um, news reports, we see newspapers actually doing articles and this is from um, one such um, news article where, which talks about the people in India still express outrage over the idea of freezing um, eggs and they did a very nice story to show uh, you know what has been the role of ARTs, the role of assisted reproductive technologies um, and you know why is there uh, you know um, a disparity in social understanding with regard to that. Why do we have, you know, multiple patterns, multiple um, stages of acceptance um, with regard to um, uh, such a technology? And um, in part, uh, as you will see if you read up the um, bill and if you read up some of these uh, news articles, that uh, oocyte cryopreservation or egg freezing as part of infertility um, treatment has been very, very um, prevalent um, in recent times um, in, um, in the country and um, of course uh, globally. But again, um, you know, um, it, it comes um, at a lot of cost and the idea of social egg freezing that you know you you do you 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 choose it as a lifestyle choice um, um, we see that india as a country is an emerging um, global market in that um, social egg freezing that um, you know you choose to freeze your eggs and then you know you claim it back when you're ready to have a family so this is just you know one of the examples for you to see that a technological advance in healthcare with regard to gender such as ART and ART is a huge huge field um, by in its own right um, can have you know significant social um, you know implications significant social um, ramifications um, and um, we have just looked at um, some of them. So, what I want you to do um, you know having read uh, some of these um, resources and having viewed some of these uh, resources that I just uh, talked about is to find out what are some of the changing sociological values and norms with respect to gender that are seen with the introduction of digital healthcare in society. So, I want you to you know do some research to find out that uh, you know traditionally what have been the traditional values um, you know sociological values norms with regard to um, you know gender and health care and are these changing so are these values and norms changing um, with regard to gender with the introduction of digital health care in society so this is you know I want you to read up some of um, the research articles uh, find you know uh, trends and patterns that we, um, uh, you know, have not talked about um, in this lecture, and uh, I want you to identify the changing values and norms. And um, if you want to read up more about how the network, um, you know, uh, in the society works with regard to um, the information uh, network, um, you can read up the um, Manuel Castells book, The Rise of the Network Society: The Information Age. And in the next lecture, we are going to look at um, you know, some of these ideas of normativity, subversions, queer identities. I just talked about queering of um, reproduction in this lecture. So, we will take a look at um, you know, more deeply what do we exactly understand by that. Thank you.